Creed 3, the ninth movie in the Rocky franchise. It's funny saying that, because that's what Hollywood has become now, franchises. The MCU, DCU, Fast and Furious, The Conjuring, Star Wars, the Tolkien properties, and I'm sure there are many more I forgot to mention, but it's kind of cool seeing these intellectual properties span into their own universe. That the party isn't necessarily over just because one movie ends. You get to stay and explore that world, but, but anyway, I digress. Let's get to the movie. So this is the third Creed movie in the series with as many directors. Michael B. Jordan, who reprises his role as Adonis Creed, also makes his directorial debut. More on that in a second. I can't wait to dive into that one. So what's the movie about? Well, the movie picks up approximately three years after Adonis Creed's last fight which was a rematch of his first fight. And after that scene, the movie time skips to the present day, and we see Adonis slowly adjusting to retired life as a trainer, manager, and promoter, who spends all of his free time with his wife and his daughter. And he's doing a great job. He has a stable of talented fighters, and one of them is the current champ. Then we see Jonathan Major's character, Damian Anderson, or Dame, show up. He and Adonis were childhood friends, best friends, until Dame went to prison. But in the movie, the two of them reconnect and bond over good times. All seems well until Dame makes it clear that he doesn't want a handout. He wants to be a fighter. You see, he was a very talented prospect before he went to prison. And now that he's out, he wants to pursue his dream. And he expects his childhood friend Adonis to help him in that career. And that's where you see the two of them begin to have their conflict. Now. When it comes to a Rocky Creed film, you have to grade them on a curve. Accept them for what they are. Because these movies are straightforward, there's no plot sophistication to them, nor are there any complex characters. The protagonist is a boxer who fights in the ring. He's not a cop trying to solve a mystery, an activist trying to expose a deep state conspiracy, and he's not a hero on a quest to save the world, nor is he a historical figure in a biopic. So these movies aren't rocket science. They don't require much thinking. People watch these films for the emotional high. They're motivational underdog stories. It's about watching Rocky or Adonis overcome their obstacles through hard work and determination. And Creed III keeps in line with that tradition. So there's training montages, epic music, and over-the-top boxing sequences. But you also have to be cognizant of the fact that this is Michael B. Jordan's debut as a director. But even with all of that leeway, I couldn't give it a high score. But before I go in on the negatives, I like to start with the positives. The fighting sequences were outstanding. Very shagadelic, baby, yeah! <laughs> this is where Michael B. Jordan excels as a director. It's the most technically proficient, realistic movie I've seen in the series. Now, I liked the Rocky movies, but none of the actors in the movie seemed like real boxers. Creed, in my opinion, has always done a better job when it comes to fight choreography. They aren't just swinging wild punches or taking blows to the head. Blows that would kill the average boxer. They're technicians. They look like professionals. You can tell that Michael B. Jordan and Jonathan Majors actually know how to fight. That they didn't just go to the gym and throw wild punches. You see them bobbing, weaving, putting up their guards. Everything that you would see a real boxer do in an actual fight. And I think that's largely due to Michael B. Jordan's anime influence. I had to lean on my, uh, my love of uh, Japanese animation and the themes of that to kind of make this one creatively and visually look different. <laughs> yes! That's awesome! He's a huge fan of Naruto, and it shows in the way the fight sequences are done. But you can also see the influence of Dragon Ball Z in his work. I was watching another YouTuber describe the fight between Creed and Dame as Goku versus Vegeta, and I thought that was a dope comparison. But I also liked his implementation of the high frame rate camera. He uses that to catch the impactful blows. So you see this cool ripple effect when a fighter's fists meets another fighter's flesh. It's hard to describe, you have to see it. Now there is a controversial scene in the fight between Creed and Dame that happens in the 11th round. A lot of people don't like it, but I loved it. Now I don't want to give it away because that's something you have to experience on your own, on top of it being hard to describe. But I want you to see it without my input, and once you do, leave a comment in the comment section and tell me what you thought about it. I love the acting in the film. Jonathan Majors is quickly becoming one of my favorite performers. He was great in Loki and Quantumania as the Kang variants, and he was great in The Harder They Fall. 
and I thought he was solid in this role too. You see, Dame, his character, is a hood dude who spent a substantial amount of time in prison. And even though he still thinks and moves with the street mentality, he doesn't play the stereotypical thug. He isn't loud and grabbing his crotch and, and using profanity in every other sentence. He's calm, calculating, intelligent, speaks with intention and an unassumed wisdom. Michael B. Jordan is solid too. He's shown a lot of range in this role. In the first Creed, he was a loud mouth trash talker with a chip on his shoulder. He was cocky and quick tempered because he was trying to prove that he was doing more than living off of his father's name. Hey, he a killer though, right, little dude? Where was you at when I was in group homes, huh? But in this one, we see him mature as an elder statesman. He's more measured. He's a father and a husband now, a business owner, as well as a mentor to younger fighters. But he still has those rough edges. Tessa Thompson, Wood Harris, and Felicia Rashad all reprise their roles as Bianca, Little Duke, and Mary Ann Creed. We see Florian Montaneo reprise his role as Victor Drago, the son of Ivan Drago, the villain in the second Creed movie. And it was really cool seeing him in the film. He's supposed to be getting his own spinoff soon, so be on the lookout for that. And the film introduces Felix Chavez and his overly protective mother, Laura Chavez, who are played by Jose Benavidez and Salinas Levia. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing those names terribly. But Felix is the current champ and the top boxer on Adonis' roster. But we have to address the elephant in the room. There was no Sylvester Stallone in the film. Now, according to an article that I read on Yahoo, Stallone says it was a creative choice made on the part of Michael B. Jordan that he wanted to take the movie in its own direction. And I don't disagree with that. Creed has to be his own distinct character, and he can't do that while he's standing in the shadow of Rocky. So I like the idea and concept of Rocky not being in the film. However, Sylvester Stallone does not. He's been putting up a major stink about being written out of the film. And he said some less than flattering things in the news lately. He, and he also seems to have an ax to grind with Erwin Winkler, who owns the rights to the Rocky franchise. And I understand why, because Rocky is his brainchild. It's his baby. He's the creator of it. And he feels as if he should have more creative liberty over the character and the franchise. If you want to know more about the issue, there are plenty of other outlets that know more about the industry and ownership rights and all that good stuff. However, I will say this. Given the way that the script was written, it's hard to argue that Sylvester Stallone was wrong. Not having him involved in the film, at least in the capacity of being a writer, might have been a mistake. Because that's my biggest issue with the film. It's the screenwriting and the pacing. The first movie was written by Ryan Coogler and Aaron Covington with Stallone's input. The second film was written by Joelle Taylor with Stallone giving an even greater input. But in this third film, Keenan Coogler, Ryan Coogler's brother, takes charge of writing the script with no input from Stallone and it shows. And you can say what you want about the way he's behaved in the press, but this movie suffered without his creative input. Now, don't get me wrong, the actors were great, but did an excellent job with the material they were given. And I get what they were going for story-wise, but they didn't have the right words to properly craft the narrative. Then there's the pacing issue. The movie tends to meander outside of the conflict between Dame and Adonis because there are too many narratives. You have Adonis and Dame as the main story. Then there's Adonis and his daughter and the conflict he has with Bianca over how the child should be raised. Then there's Felicia Rashad's character, Mary Ann Creed, and the issues she's having with aging. Then you have Adonis trying to manage Felix, the current champion, and how he's having a conflict with his overly involved mother. Then you have this whole thing with Bianca, Creed's wife, not feeling fulfilled in her professional life. Huh? Yeah, you better believe I'm going to talk about that one. As a matter of fact, stay tuned for my spoiler field collaboration with Dr. Tia San Johnson. You best believe we're going to dig into that one. We'll be going live Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll post the link to his channel and be sure you subscribe. But my point is, all of these narratives don't tie into each other. It's like they had too many ideas at once and couldn't settle on one or couldn't figure out how to mesh them together into one neat narrative. Sometimes the film feels like a daddy-daughter movie, but then sometimes it looks like it's supposed to be giving you an inside look on the boxing business, where we see Creed functioning as a promoter and trainer. 
But then it wants to be a comeback story with Adonis coming out of retirement to face Dane. It's all over the place, with each story bumping into each other, making the overall plot feel messy and disjointed. But even still, I like it for what it was. Like I said, you have to grade this movie on a curve. It's a Rocky franchise film, done by a first-time director. Though I don't necessarily blame Michael B. Jordan for the film's shortcomings. The script was messy, but he did an okay job considering the situation he was in. Again, the fight sequences were spectacular. It was entertaining, and I would watch it again. So I give the movie a 6 out of 10. It was above average, and really fun to watch at moments. Okay, so you've heard me say this a million times. So if you like this video, please give it a like and leave a comment in the comments section and share the link on your social media platforms. And if you are new to my channel, please subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you'll get alerts every time I upload new content. This is The Layman's Journal. Thanks for stopping by. I'm out. Hell! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! And while I do appreciate you sharing, subbing, and leaving comments, I'm going to ask that you take another step further in keeping the channel going. I set up a membership plan for those of you who would like to offer further support in the development of this channel. It's not anything expensive or special, I'm just asking for 99 cents a month, which is enough for me to continue doing the work that I do here. Help me! Help me! N Help me! In the future, there will be additional tiers with added benefits, but for right now, I just need your support so that I can cover basic costs. So please, sign up so I can continue bringing you awesome content. This is The Layman's Journal. I'm out.